Hello, uh, my name is George Diaz, and I am the CMOS Business Scholar for the 2011-2012 year. And today I'll be speaking to you about my research which examines smuggling on the U.S.-Mexico border. The title of my talk is, My Heroes Have Always Been Contrabandistas, Corridos as Reflections of Popular Attitudes on Smuggling in the Lower Rio Grande Borderlands from the 1880s to the 1940s. Oral history is very old. Books, such as those that make up the Bible, were composed from oral histories or stories passed down from one generation to another. Some of these stories, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, were retold as song. This tradition of retelling stories to preserve a group's culture and as a set of values has continued to this day. Today I will talk about how ethnic Mexican folk ballads, or corridos, reflect popular attitudes about smuggling along the border. And just to give you a little flavor of what I'm speaking about, let me play a snippet for you. line from the song, or the corrido, Los Tequileros, which was recorded in the 1920s, based on an incident that I'll speak to you about. On April 26, 1887, Mexico's foreign minister of the United States, Matias Romero, sat down to write what must have been a very difficult letter to the American Secretary of State in Washington. Romero wrote that north of the Rio Grande, between the villas of Camargo and Laredo, which are there on the map, reside the known smuggler Mariano Resendez, leader of an armed band of contrabandistas that had left members of the Mexican Customs Forces dead and wounded. From his base on the U.S. side of the border, Resendez organized parties in, quote, considerable number that, res that resisted Mexican authorities. Resendez's actions were so heinous that simply calling his band smugglers was insufficient. Evil doers would be more apt. Would the American secretary instruct the proper authorities to, not, to, to deny Resendez, quote, organization of smuggling expeditions that invade Mexico? Now the question is, how did a man who smuggled cloth for a living pose a threat to the Mexican government. We're not talking about the smuggling of drugs or guns, we're talking about the smuggling of consumer goods at this point. Aside from his armed confrontations, which challenged the authority of the Mexican state, Resendez and other contrabandistas' unlawful importation of American consumer goods defrauded the Mexican government of a significant amount of customs revenues. Despite the failure of the customs service along the lower Rio Grande, Customs receipts continue to be a critical part of the Mexican treasury. Basically, customs duties are taxes on imports. Imposts on foreign goods provided Mexico with over $23 million, or over half of its national budget, for the 1895-1896 fiscal year. Tariff collection provided Mexico an average of $14 million between the fiscal years of 1869 and 1896. Foreign loans during Porfirio Diaz modernization campaigns had cost Mexico greatly. In the summer of 1896, the country's national debt stood at over $200 million. If the Mexican government could end smugglers' operations on the lower Rio Grande border, it stood to add significantly to its national revenue. So basically, it becomes economic security to collect the duties on these imports that are coming across the line. So the, U the U.S. and Mexican Customs Services are patrolling the border not to catch smugglers who are importing something that's dangerous like drugs or guns, but in the 19th century to collect taxes because the country needs the money. This is what contributes to what I call a moral economy of smuggling, where smuggling becomes socially acceptable on some level. And these songs I'm going to be speaking about reflect that. Smuggling tapped into popular local resentment toward excessive national tariffs or these high import duties. In 1884, locals complained of a, quote, too rigid enforcement 
on the part of Mexican customs collector in Nuevo Laredo. That locals complained that customs enforcement was excessive reveals that locals expected a certain amount of leniency in regards to the practice of illicit trade. They basically expected that the people who were taxing uh, these import duties would basically be accepting of a little bit of smuggling, just look the other way. Most borderlanders, or border people, regarded smuggling as a libertarian practice or a just way around onerous government tariffs. Bresenis's notoriety was such that local borderlanders or border people celebrated him in song or wrote a song about him, like the, the song I just played for you. The late 19th century borderland corrido or folk ballad of Mariano Resendez uh, talks about this. In the song, Resendez challenges, quote, cowardly border guards who live off the government's bounty. So the song talks about how he's criticizing the government uh, duties. Resendez's apocryphal challenge resonated with people of the time. Mexican customs agents received a portion of the fines they collected on tariff evasion. For example, on December 5, 1899, Pedro Arruelles, the Mexican customs administrator in Nuevo Laredo, received $4.98, or 37% of a fine against a man who undervalued his import declaration. Basically, he was lying about the value of his import duties, and he was fined for this lying, and the customs agent who was collecting it received part of the fine. So the people who are collecting the tariffs like to catch you smuggling because they make more money personally when they arrest you. Arruelles was not the only officer to profit from the fine. The contador received $2.29, or 17%, while the vista or overseer received $4.84, or 36% of the same fine. With money to be made imposing and collecting fines, Mexican customs agents had a personal interest in being strict, and people had a reason to view them as predatory. Mexican borderlanders did not see tariffs as protective instruments for national industry or legitimate sources of government revenue, our way is admitted, but as simply tribute. So the people didn't see this taxes or these tariffs on crossing goods across the border as legitimate. They didn't think it something that was good for the government to raise money. They saw it as paying tribute to a government that wasn't helping them out. They see it as meddling in their personal affairs. They didn't like being taxed. Local contempt for official corruption played a part in trafficking-related violence. The Corrido of Mariano Resendez laments that Mexican authorities, quote, let the big contrabands pass while they catch the small timers. And these are quotes from songs suggesting that customs agents were corrupt and only pursued contrabandistas that failed to bribe them. U.S. consular dispatches verified Mexican officials' corruption and complicity with smugglers. Consul Joseph Donnelly complained that, quote, smuggling is an organized business, carried on with the cognizance, if not the concealed cooperation of local Mexican authorities. Contrabandistas like Restendez could not or refused to bribe corrupt officials for the right to smuggle, especially considering they could pay these same agents and transport their goods legally. Norteños, or Mexicans from the northern part of the country, had every reason to resent invasive Mexican customs duties and the men who enforced them. In 1888, fiscal agents, or Mexican customs agents, were reputed to have opened each box of a shipment of sardines to check their contents. Still, such invasiveness, them going through your goods, may have stemmed from corrupt officers' attempts to solicit a bribe. Border custom decreed that poorly paid officers supplement their meager income with bribes, known as mordidas, or bites. A pretense of decorum and officers' personal honor necessitated that bribes be less than overt. You couldn't just bribe someone openly. Thus, experienced border people avoided Mexican customs agents ransacking their goods by leaving the bribe on top of the items to be inspected where it could be easily seen and collected. The Mexican customs agents who repeatedly checked every box of sardines in search of contraband may have simply been looking for their mordida or their bribe. Corrupt agents may have also used the threat of invasive inspections to coerce a bribe. Basically, if you bribe me, I'm not going to be ransacking through your stuff. As C.E. Hodson noted, by the late 19th century, 
Mexican customs agents had forged a, quote, reputation for being licensed brigands or licensed thieves. Consumer goods, like the textiles or cloth that are sent as traffic, fell inside a moral economy of smuggling on the borderlands. Aside from the money, Mariano and his band enjoyed other benefits of the trade. Because Mariano provided consumer goods at affordable prices, he received public support and local prestige. He was smuggling cloth that was cheaper than the cloth available in Mexico, and because of this, he's providing a service, and therefore he is considered to be a folk hero. That's why they write songs about him. Onerous Mexican customs tariffs made consumer goods so expensive that many border people accepted smuggling as a common right. They began to think smuggling was not wrong. Moreover, Mexican border people on the margins of their governments were wanting in material goods that their domestic industries had failed to supply. An American correspondent visiting South Coahuila in 1888 commented that even the finer homes were in, quote, a condition of squalor for want of fine furniture. The little furniture wealthy Mexicans did have was reportedly so poorly made that tables and chairs overturned with the slightest touch and its finished wood stained those who touched it. With smuggling filling a basic need, smuggling ceased to be a crime in the eyes of the community. With protective federal tariffs being routinely evaded, Mexican-made goods could not compete against inexpensive and desirable American products. Aside from the moral economy of illicit trade on the border, male smugglers' machismo, or their masculine honor, further justified smuggling-related violence. Like other borderland heroes or ballad heroes, Resendez won honor by defying discredited state authority and defending his right with force. So basically by fighting a government that the people did not like, he became a hero. Resendez and his men operated in heavily armed mounted groups along lonely stretches of highway and backcountry trails. And I have a slide for you. Oh, here's a signature of Mariano Resendez. Someone was talking about him and I found it. This is an image by Frederick Remington. He is a famous American artist of the American West. And uh, this is a print of smugglers being attacked by Mexican customs agents. So I really like that there's an image of, uh, by a famous American artist of smuggling along the border. And we can imagine that this is something of like what Resendez was up to. Many contrabandistas operate at night like Resendez. Resendez's nocturnal operations may have been an attempt to avoid clashes with Mexican customs agents, but like other contrabandistas, Resendez could fight when confronted. Ballad singers claim Resendez was known to yell, gather around my companions or they will take our contraband. So this is a line from the song. But Resendez did when Mexican forces finally succeeded in capturing him in November of 1887 is unknown. Border lore holds that Mexican forces surrounded him and took him by surprise. They executed him on the road to Monterrey shortly afterward. So, Resendez is killed. Although dead, Resendez was not forgotten. Resendez's actions earned him a corrido in his honor, so people saw that this man was providing a service to them by smuggling consumer goods that they wanted, and he died fighting against a government that was not popular, the Mexican government which was not providing for its people. That Locals wrote a song about a famous smuggler, and that's the Corrido of Manuel Resendez, which I'm speaking about. Resendez resisted unpopular laws through his trafficking and made a profit while also providing a service to his fellow border people by selling less expensive smuggled American goods. Whereas the Mexican government regarded Resendez as, quote, an evildoer who challenged state authority, rural border people regarded him as a hero. The Resendez of the Corrido is competent and suave, bragging of the quality of his contraband cloth and challenging Mexican customs forces to take them if they can. Resendez's Corrido reflects popular attitudes about smuggling. Rather than vilifying him, Resendez's smuggling and conflicts with the government won him prestige and honor among the community he was a part of. Marian Resendez was more than a simple smuggler. His confrontations with the Mexican government and the scale of his operations won him the title, The Smuggler. 
from the government and ethnic Mexican border people. Ballad singers called him Don Mariano out of respect. It is noteworthy that the ballad places Mariano Resendez's death in 1900, 13 years after his actual death at the hands of Mexican government forces. Although this inconsistency may be attributed to balladeers' creative license to make a rhyme, it also suggests a community's reluctance to give up a hero. Some border people hold that Mexican forces never killed Mariano Resendez at all, and that he bribed corrupt officials to have his body replaced with that of another, leaving him to live out the rest of his days in peace near Laredo. Just how Mariano Resendez died is not important. What is significant is that many working class ethnic Mexican border people chose to celebrate the exploits of a man who smuggled cloth for a living. An anonymous minstrel composed the corrido of Mariano Resendez shortly after the smuggler's death in 1887, and the song remains popular to this day. By instituting high tariffs on basic goods that people needed, the Mexican government transformed smugglers into folk heroes. And at this point, I'm going to move a little bit ahead chronologically in time from the 1880s to the 19, uh, teens and 20s with Prohibition. Prohibition is a time in American history when alcohol was effectively illegal in the United States. Um, it is a product of decades of waspish enforcement on the half, on the half of fundamentalist uh, Protestants who wanted to keep alcohol from entering the country. So what this national laws do is push criminal activity to the border. You cannot get alcohol legally in the United States. So what happens is you have to go to the border to get it. And that's why I like this image so much. This is by Frank Kenny Johnson from 1925. Uh, pardon the Spanish, I know it's incorrect, but that's the title of his painting. It's called Contrabandista a la Frontera, or Smuggling Along the Border. I'm sorry for the quality of the image, but it's the best one I can do. And what I like about it is it shows that people have images of smuggling going back to the early part of the 20th century, and it shows cooperation between Mexican smugglers, and it happens to be perhaps Anglos. You see the Mexican smugglers on the right side of the image coming up, and the guy armed, and the bodos, which are loaded with contraband goods, about to be transferred to what looks like Anglos with their hats, and we're going to go back to this image later on. So one of the things that I need to set up as a backstory is there was a lot of ethnic conflict on the U.S.-Mexico borderland. The Texas Rangers uh, had a reputation for violence, of shooting first and asking questions later, and of being very, very brutal in their activity against Mexican Americans. So what happens is sometimes they would run into these people uh, that were Mexican Americans that were on the border and would engage them in shootouts and call them smugglers, and uh, we're going to talk about that next. So perhaps the most striking example of American law enforcement killing a group of ethnic Mexicans and calling them smugglers came in April of 1920, when U.S. Customs agents engaged a group of mounted men 45 miles southeast of Laredo. Presencio Oliveira Jr., Denicio Maldonado, and Vicente Aguilar were killed in the shootings. Area newspapers reported the men were returning from smuggling liquor into the United States and go on to mention that officers recovered quote, a small amount of ammunition and several pair of new shoes off the victims. Although English language newspapers dubbed the victims smugglers, ethnic Mexican locals remembered the deaths of three quite differently. So if you can look briefly at the image behind me that looks at the newspaper clipping of the event, it says, in pitched battle with smugglers, three of the smugglers are killed. Four customs men are fired on by members of a Mexican or a smuggling gang, and they get three of the men. So think about that for an in, uh, for an instance. It says battle with smugglers gang, and it says the smugglers fired first. And yet, if you keep on reading, you'll realize that the smugglers were all killed, and none of the officers were wounded. So isn't that strange that the smugglers fired first? They get killed. The smugglers do and they don't wound any of the law enforcement officers. So what I did is I looked at that newspaper clipping of that event, and then I went back and I found that there actually was a song about it, and I looked at what the song said compared to what Anglo newspapers do. So let's think about this for a minute. In looking at smuggling, we're talking about only records 
that are recorded. When smuggling is successful, there's no record of it because the smugglers get away. So I only have cases of newspaper clippings when smugglers get engaged in firefights or when there is a trial. So most of these documents are written in English. In the early 20th century, this is a time of great prejudice, of course. So it has a very, very negative image of these smugglers. You know, court cases calling them criminals, uh, newspaper clippings calling them bandits. So then you take these sources and you compare that with these ethnic Mexican folk ballads to create a synthesis and try to compare these two things. So, although English language newspapers dubbed the victims smugglers, ethnic Mexican locals remember the deaths of three quite differently. The Corrido, Dionisio Maldonado, sometimes called the Corrido de Oliveira, records the ambush and murder of the three men. And this is his headstone, which is in Benavides, Texas. So these people are famous smugglers. So that newspaper clipping I showed you led to the death of this man, and there's a song about him. I'm going to tell you about the song about it. So in the song, which records the ambush of three men, it's a little bit different than the newspaper clipping that I just showed you. The murder of three men, it makes no mention of their involvement in smuggling. The song doesn't mention that they were involved in smuggling. It's interesting, right? Rather, local holds, local people argue that the three people who were killed were part of a wedding party on their way to Mexico, where Crescencio Oliveira was to be married. Olivera speaks the last lines of the song, lamenting the loss of his, quote, betrothed who he left behind. The new shoes that law enforcement discovered were intended as wedding presents, whereas the two rifles and the revolver the dead men had were nothing more than their sidearms. I think Mexican versions of events is inadvertently supported by English language newspapers, which state that no alcohol was discovered on the victims. So think about it like this. Why does the newspaper clipping call them smugglers, and yet after they're, these quote smugglers are killed, they don't find any contraband liquor on them. They find things like new shoes and a rifle or two. Well, the rifle or two can be explained by defending themselves. So the Texas Rangers kill these three guys, call them Mexican smugglers, a gang, and then at the end of this newspaper report, it says they don't have any alcohol because they were returning from having smuggled. That doesn't sound like that's accurate to me. And then it says things further in the newspaper clipping, like the Mexicans fired first, yet none of the officers were wounded. So it sounds shady. It sounds like these guys were actually massacred. And then you compare that with the song, and you kind of see a different perspective. So it's uh, the song is needed to provide balance, as opposed to this you know, one-sided account. You look at these things from different angles, and you get to understand what historians do in terms of understanding the past from different perceptions. Ethnic Mexican version of events is inadvertently supported by English language newspapers which state that no alcohol was discovered from the victims. After a brief inquest by a Justice of the Peace, officers buried the three, quote, near where they were killed, likely meaning a shallow grave. And this image is not a shallow grave, the image behind me of the cross. Uh, the family disinterred the victims and gave them a proper burial. Anglos and ethnic Mexicans had differing views on tequileros, or these liquor smugglers. Let me go back to show you these liquor smugglers. Basically, during the Prohibition era, uh, many people on the border saw an opportunity to make money, so they loaded alcohol on the backs of puros and horses and crossed into the United States. So this is an image of what the tequileros basically look like. These guys happen to have gotten arrested. So you can see that they're mounted, and they have these uh, sacks of tequila behind them, and the officers are basically taking a, a trophy picture of them. So Anglos and ethnic Mexicans had different views of these tequileros. Ethnic Mexican liquor smugglers, or the tequileros. American law enforcement saw tequileros as criminal smugglers and armed invaders. William Warren Sterling, a Texas Ranger who fought against, these te against the tequileros, called them freebooters who would not hesitate to kill anybody who happened to cross their trail. Monty Gilliland, a longtime resident of South Texas, and the daughter and later wife to a Texas ranger, wrote that Dickie Lettos were, quote, unbelievably cruel and ruthless Mexican bandits. Many Texas rangers and mounted customs officers held the belief 
that the sediciosos of the Plan of San Diego had returned as tequileros during Prohibition, or these bandits that had been raiding the border the decade before were now smuggling liquor. Some tequileros of the Prohibition era may have been former sediciosos, but just how many cannot be verified. Ethnic Mexican borderlanders had an entirely different view of these same smugglers. Whereas American law enforcement tended to view all tequileros as hardened professional criminals and Mexican nationals, this was not the case. The corrido, or the folk song Laredo, Laredo, sings of tequileros as individuals who were, quote, not criminals, but men who had distinguished themselves during that famed World War, or basically World War I veterans. Indeed, many Mexican Americans in the area had fought for the United States in World War I, and it is reasonable that some returning veterans had become tequileros. Mexicans and Mexican Americans both rode the South Texas brush country with sacks of tequila. Leandro Viedral, the famous corrido Los Tequileros, and I have a picture of Leandro. Offers a contrasting view of tequileros than that of U.S. law enforcement. So this is Leandro from Los Tequileros from the song. In the corrido, two professional smugglers, Jerónimo and Silvano, cross the Rio Grande into Texas and decide to add another man to their party to increase their numbers. Leandro initially refused because he was sick. According to the song and family history, because I interviewed the family members, Leandro was not a professional smuggler like the other men. He was young, only about 18 years old, and he had never smuggled before or otherwise broken the law. Leandro, like many rural Tejanos, had only a few years of elementary education. He made some money from a little billiard hall that operated across the river in Guerrero, Tamaulipas, but not enough, apparently. Times had been hard for Leandro since his wife had died and the money he could make working with the other smugglers could help raise the three children his dead wife had left him. What Jeronimo and Silvano, the other smugglers, told Leandro to persuade him out of his sick bed is unknown, but leave it he did. When the trio came across the Rinches, or the Texas Rangers, Leandro was the first one to be killed. Leandro Villarreal's story shows that Tequileros were more than the armed brigands that U.S. law enforcement made them out to be. Not all of them were hardened traffickers. Some are merely young men from rural backgrounds trying to get by. And I like to ask the question sometimes to my students is, what do smugglers look like? I mean, you often get the image of smugglers being these bearded men with rifles who are, do terrible things. But the image I have of Leandro is that of him on his wedding day. So some of these people, you know, had children, had families, were not necessarily criminal people, but saw smuggling as something to be done on the side to make a little bit of money. Alcohol was... Um, socially accepted for the most part and people didn't think drinking liquor was incorrect even though it was illegal during prohibition. Given their knowledge of the South Texas brush country and their ability to pack and drive animals it seems that most if not all tequileros were ethnic Mexicans from the region's rural areas. Some were professional smugglers and others were novices. Tequileros may have resorted to violence at times, but in the eyes of many of their community, they were heroes to be honored in song. Tequileros might have been former sediciosos who turned to liquor running to continue their resistance to U.S. control, or they could have been opportunistic entrepreneurs who saw liquor smuggling as a good way to make money. A few seem to have been desperate men who could kill indiscriminately, but most seem to have been prudent businessmen who avoided confrontation and turned to violence as a last resort. Let's go back a little bit. I want to show you some images. Here's a map, more or less, of where the smugglers were going through. This is South Texas we're talking about, and you see their trail. So the liquor smugglers would come up from Mexico and go to those regions to leave off the liquor. And the region they're going through is actually a very, very dense countryside of mesquite, which is thorny brushes. And if you look at some of the trails they live around, these guys are not going looking for trouble. They're going out at night through the brush country trying to avoid confrontation. They're not looking for trouble. They just want to avoid confrontation. So these people were more like businessmen than people who were looking for violence. Whether they intended to or not, however, tequileto smuggling and battles with U.S. law enforcement fell into the ethnic Mexican tradition of resistance to Anglo-racism and American incorporation. Tequileto's actions in fact and song added to the machista culture of the border. 
Their courage, real or imagined, is enshrined in lore as examples of masculinity and honor. They are history and also legend. The Corrida Los Tequideros is based on the deaths of three smokers at the hands of American law enforcement on December 18, 1922. On December 17, 1922, a group of Texas Rangers and mounted custom inspectors patrolling the Jennings Ranch in Zapata County came across some suspicious tracks. Early the next morning, they began tracking them. The officers followed the trail for 20 miles and were in Jibhound County when they came across the smugglers about 2 p.m. It was rough country, hills, mesquite thicket, and arroyos. Perched on a hilltop, the smugglers looked down upon their quarry. Ranger Captain William Wright had fought smugglers before, and he knew the coverless canyon edges offered no protection from the Winchester and high-powered Mauser rifles that Gileros had carried. Rather than engage the smugglers, he prepared an ambush. Wright and one of his men stationed themselves on the west side of the pack. Two took positions on the eastern side, and thus the officers hit on the southern end to block any retreat and, quote, flush the game, like they were animals, to the barren northern ridge where the smugglers would be cut down. Wright's ambush worked exactly as planned. The officer guarding the southern end opened fire with his rifle, driving the three smugglers to where Wright and the others waited. Smugglers ran pell-mell into the bush, and the others took their horses trying to escape. When the shooting ended a few moments later, the three, quote, Mexicans were dead. A dead smuggler was found holding two ends of a broken rifle. A bullet had cut the stock in half. After counting the balas of tequila, officers dashed them against the ground. For good measure, they lit the pile, and a long blue flame reached into the darkening sky. Officers camped there that night. The smugglers' uneaten lunch became their killer's supper. Jeronimo, Silvano, and Diandro were left where they fell until, quote, a coroner came out and said they were dead. After the matchlight inquest, officers buried them in shallow graves. Ranger historian Walter Prescott Webb quotes Ranger's sentiments over the death starkly. In an unsigned dispatch to a Ranger captain, a recently bloodied private wrote, The other day we run into some horsebackers, or liquor smugglers, and one of them thought he would learn me how to shoot, so I naturalized him made an American citizen out of him. Basically, he's an American citizen because he's now buried. As Prohibition wore on, increased state policing succeeded in ending tequilero forays into the U.S., but not in ending smuggling. Bootleggers succeeded tequileros as the principal traffickers of contraband liquor into the United States. So as smuggling-related violence increases during the 1920s and into the 1930s and 40s, we get into narcotics, these songs that celebrate smugglers change. Not all songs celebrate smugglers. These folk ballads don't always do that. Some of these smugglers are bad, and these other songs that we'll talk about now condemn them. Bootleggers, for instance. Bootleggers uh, are not only ethnic Mexicans, but Anglos who loaded liquor on the, and cars. So instead of these sticky who are going out to the countryside on, with animals at night, like in the Western tradition, these people are modern traffickers who put alcohol in cars and are smuggling that way. They tend to be more violent. Bootleggers' greater violence and use of modern equipment push them beyond the limits of the moral economy of illicit trade on the border. Tequileros' packing and driving of animals through the brush country took a certain skill and hardiness that Tejanos esteemed. Bootleggers, in contrast, simply hid alcohol in cars and drove. Such was bootleggers' disdain by the contrabandista community that Tejanos eulogized officers who combated them in songs. So there's actually songs about officers who, as opposed to before. The 1920s era corrido of Capitan Charles Stevens, or Captain Charles Stevens, honors the life and death of Prohibition agent Charles Stevens. Unlike the corrido Los Tequileros, which described American law enforcement officers as rinches, Stevens' corrido describes him lonely, nobly. Stevens is described as, quote, a man who had eagle eyes and who in life was known as the Panther. In contrast to the law enforcement officers in Los Tequileros, who are described as cowards, Stevens is described as a brave man who, quote, fought gallantly and without fear. Stevens was a real person. Charles Stevens was a former Texas Ranger captain who had served as a U.S. Customs agent in Laredo. At the time of his death, Stevens worked as a U.S. Prohibition agent. 
In late September 1929, Stevens and two other officers were returning from raiding stills in Atascosa County when they spotted a woman on the roadside who seemed to be signaling someone with a spotlight. Stevens pulled over and decided to take the woman in for questioning. Several men sprang from behind some foliage and shot at Stevens' car. Buckshots tore through his body, killing him. Although the other officers returned fire and may have wounded two of the assailants, the killers escaped. The Corridos' positive representation of Stevens is attributable to several factors. He did not kill ethnic Mexicans through ambush, like the Cousins agents and Texas Rangers who killed the three tequileros on December 18th, or the Corridos los Tequileros, the one about Leandro. Tejano's honoring of Stevens through song shows that relations between Anglos and ethnic Mexicans at the time were not always contentious. Not all American law enforcement were inches. Some, like Stevens, could be seen as brave and honorable. Moreover, Stevens did not work against tequileros, but rather primarily against Anglo moonshiners and violent criminal bootleggers. Locals seemed to have despised bootleggers. The border battle El Automobile Gris, or the Grey Automobile, captures bootleggers' greater tendencies toward violence. Unlike corridos, about tequileros that celebrate their valor against the rinches, the members of the Grey Automobile Gang, or the song about them, are, quote, the hand that squeezes, that assaults, that kills, that robs. Very negative image of smugglers this song is. Bootleggers were a different breed of smuggler than the tequilero. Tequileros were rural folk from, uh, who were criminals in the eyes of the government, but not necessarily the people. Locals saw bootleggers as less honorable than the tequileros they succeeded. The bootlegger in El Automobile Gris is a decadent gangster who could be seen, quote, drunk, smoking fine cigars, drinking cognac, sherry, and beer to the sound of merrymaking. So let me go to a slide of one of these individuals I'm talking about. Joe Hobrick, Stevens' alleged murderer, fits bootlegger's image as gangsters. One newspaper published a mugshot of Hobrick where the clean-shaven, quote, dapper youth could be seen with his dark hair slicked back and wearing a suit and a tie. Bootleggers, a new breed of criminal on the border, were amongst the first smugglers to extend their illicit trade networks beyond their regional communities. The singer in Automobile Gris boasted his business in Matamoros, San Antonio, Laredo, and Berlin. Bootleggers were amongst the first modern traffickers along the U.S.-Mexico border. The dangers of narcotic smuggling were also becoming a part of border lore. El Contrabandista, one of the earliest narcocorridos, or drug smuggling corridos, recorded in 1934 in San Antonio, Texas, recalls the downfall of a former liquor smuggler turned drug trafficker who ends his days behind the bars in a Texas prison. Carga Blanca, written in the 1940s and easily the most popular narcocorrido of the era, recounts the tale of Jose and Ramon, who crossed the river with Carga Blanca, or white cargo, basically meaning either cocaine or more likely heroin. The two sell the drugs for 2,800 pesos to a buyer in San Antonio, but a killer murders the pair on their return journey home and takes the money back to the buyers. Although Jose and Ramon's story cannot be traced back to a single historical incident, the song indicates that as early as the 1940s, ethnic Mexicans of the borderlands knew the dangers and profits of the drug trade. Narcocorridos, or drug smuggling ballads, depictions of drug smugglers contrast sharply with the heroes of earlier corridos and serve as a warning against those who overstep the moral economy of illicit trade. Unlike the corridos, Mariano Resendez are los tequileros, which depict smugglers in heroic light, fighting against discredited state agents. The protagonists in El Contrabandista and Carga Blanca, these drug smuggling ballads from the 30s and 40s, come to inglorious ends. Texas law enforcement apprehended the protagonists in El Contrabandista without a fight and threw him in jail. After Jose and Ramon are murdered for their drug money, the balladier closes, quote, leave this crooked business alone, just see what has happened. So the song is actually warning people not to do these things. 
modern narcocorridos, or contemporary drug smuggling ballads, continue to fall away from the ballad heroes of old. Contrabando y Tradición, a 1970s corrido which warns of dangers of love and the drug trade, is entirely fictional. So in terms of like these earlier songs being based on historical incidences, many of these new drug smuggling ballads are completely fictional. Moreover, many contemporary narcocorridos are commissioned by those involved in the drug trade and serve as a means of self-promotion rather than as a reflection of popular support. So these guys are paying to have songs written about them, these drug dealers, as opposed to these old songs where something happens and people feel like inspired to write a song about them. Rather than delve into the meaning of contemporary narcocorridos, this lecture shows how classic corridos reflect popular attitudes about smuggling in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you.